How we doing? Ready for that big snowstorm coming? I mean, that is on the news. It's like the number one story. But you're here, and I'm glad you're here this morning. And I'd like you to turn to John chapter 4, to one of the most amazing teachings on how up. How about on all. How we doing? Ready for that big snowstorm coming? I mean, that is on the news. It's like the number one story. But you're here, and I'm glad you're here this morning. And I'd like you to turn to John chapter 4, to one of the most amazing teachings on worship. Jesus taught on all kinds of subjects, but if you really want to know what he thought about worship and how we worship, who we worship, where we worship, when we worship, you need to turn to John chapter 4. Because in, that, in this passage, we will learn some really wonderful principles of worship. We need to be taught about worship. We need the scriptures, we need Christ's teaching, we need the Holy Spirit for us to understand this very, very important subject of worshiping God. Before uh, we open up this text, this wonderful, radical passage, let's pray. Lord, we come to you before we delve in to your teaching and to your words. And we ask that the Spirit of God would come and that the Spirit of God would enlighten our minds, open up our hearts to receive this teaching from Jesus. I pray that we would be worshipers of you. I pray, Father, for anyone in here, in this auditorium, who does not know you, who's never truly worshipped you, I pray that today they would bow their knee, raise their eyes to your throne of grace, and they would receive your grace and become a worshiper of you from now and throughout all eternity. And Lord, we give you this time together in Christ's name. Amen. If you want to take out your notes, that'd be great. That might help you. And we're going to look at some principles of worship. The first principle is this. God seeks worshipers. He's seeking worshipers. John chapter 4 has a very strange background because it's talking about the Samaritans and the Jews. And we don't know much about that. So it's hard for us to understand this context. But let me help you a little bit. Uh, The Samaritans and the Jews did not like each other uh, for over 700 years. Uh, They uh, were bitter enemies and uh, talked negatively about each other. And and there was always problems between the Jews and those that called themselves Samaritans. It happened in 722. Assyria came down and swept through Samaria or swept through Israel, the northern kingdom. And exile took all their people except for the poor because they didn't want to have a welfare system for the poor in their Syrian kingdom. So they kept the poor there, uh, poor Jews. And so the rest of them were exiled to Assyria. And then they repopulated the area with five different cultures, five different languages, five different kinds of religion. The the, The Jews that remained held on to some of their traditions, but it became synchronistic. They combined Judaism with these other religions. And they combined, and of course they intermarried, and uh, there was a combination of those that were foreigners marrying uh, those that were Jews. And over a period of 700 years, this division became greater and greater and greater. The Samaritans believed that only the first five books of the Bible were inspired and so they uh, uh, b- believed in the books of Moses, not believe in the books of the prophets and the historical books and the poetry books. And so they had a different scripture. Uh, so Jesus is, uh, he's, a, he's a different kind of, of man because he, he walked into Samaria in this racially charged atmosphere. He walks in there sits at a well, 
And then he starts to talk to a Samaritan woman. Now, women were not highly regarded among the Jews either. So here is Jesus breaking a racial barrier, a religious barrier, a cultural barrier, a gender barrier. And he's going to go and he's going to talk to the Samaritan woman. And so he begins to talk to her because he's seeking her out to be a worshiper of God. And so he seeks and he probes and he talks to her about living water. And then in verse 16, he says this. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I want to talk to you more about how you, become, how you can become a worshiper of God. I want to talk to you more about this living water. I want to talk to you more about salvation. I want to talk to you more about eternity and eternal matters. And so I want you to go, and I want you to go get your husband and bring him back. And she says, well, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And so Jesus is doing spiritual surgery on her. She, he, he is going to a place of great hurt, great immorality, a great place of shame in her life. And he is going to work with her, show her grace, show her forgiveness, show her a new life, show her that all this background and all this past hurt in her life can be uh, used by God and, and God will accept her through, the grace, through his grace and mercy and that she can have a relationship with him and be a true worshiper of Jesus, of the Father. God seeks worshipers. Mission and worship go together. The reason why we send people all over the world is so that the nations can exalt and worship God. The reason why we tell others about Christ is so that they too can be worshipers of Christ. The reason why this story is in our text in the Bible is because we all struggle with this in our own way, in our own kind of thinking. We say to ourselves, how can I worship God when I have done this and when I have done that and when I am this way? And, and, I, and I, why would God want to be worshipped by me? And we struggle with that. And here is Jesus giving us an example. Someone who's had five husbands, and she's living with a guy now, and Jesus did not turn his back on her. He did not condemn her, but he brought her along in his grace and in his words of wisdom to her. And so... The text, we're going to get it later on. God seeks worshipers. He wants this whole city to be worshiping him. How many worshipers do we have in our community? He wants everyone to be a worshiper. How many do we have in our town? 24,000. He wants 24,000 people in church right now. Do you believe that? 24,000 people should be worshiping God. He seeks worshipers through us. He wants you to be a worshiper no matter where you've been, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter your past. He wants you to be worshiping the Father. Now, to worship means to honor God, to reverence God, to bow before God, to, to be, in, be in the presence of someone superior than you are, to come face to face with God in a sense of, of, of worshiping the Father. And so God wanted that from the Samaritan woman. 
He wants that out of your life. He wants you to be a worshiper of God. Secondly, you can worship God any time and any place. So, the woman says, Sir, the woman says, I can see that you are a prophet. I mean, to me, I find that a little humorous. I can see you are a prophet. He's the son of God. He's God. But she is growing in her faith of who Christ is. And by the end of this story, she will know that Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the Savior. Christ is the Son of God. And she will put her faith in him. Right now, she's saying to herself, God is... Uh, the Christ, Jesus is a prophet. Now, a prophet has two functions in the Old Testament. It, a prophet is a person who foretells the future and can look deeply into your life and tell what's going on. Or a prophet can foretell the Word of God. So he gets the Word of God. Uh, he or she gets the Word of God and brings the word of God to light. And so she's using it in both senses of this word, that what Christ has said is amazing. His words must come from God. And secondly, that this prophet can peer into her life and see what's happening and know exactly what she has done. She has been married five times. How else would Jesus know this unless he was a true prophet, which he was? Now, prophets are scary to be around because you want someone looking through your life? <laughs> there you are. And he knows everything that's happened. And so she's a little nervous about Jesus. Would you be nervous about Christ if he could look, pierce through your life, which you can, pierce through your life and know exactly what's happening? And that makes us all nervous. So what do you do when you're nervous and you have a prophet in your midst? You change the subject. That's what you do. Jesus is talking about you're living with someone. What are you going to do? You're going to sit there and say, uh, let's talk about that further, Jesus. Let's engage in a conversation about this. That ain't going to happen. And so she's nervous. She's scared because being around a prophet is an awesome thing. It is uh, to be around Christ is uh, not a comfortable conversation sometimes. And so she's going to change the subject. Anyone ever do that? When things get a little hot, you change the subject. You have a fight, not that you would ever would have a fight with your wife, but let's say you did, and if a smart husband will do what? He will change the subject. Let's go over here and talk about this. And so that's what she's doing. And she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. We're getting into the subject of worship now, of honoring God coming before him. And he says, our fathers, the worship they had was on this mountain, which is Mount Gerizim. Uh, but, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And so she has gone from... I've been married five times, and the guy I'm living with right now, I'm not married to, I'm living with. Two, let's talk about worship. And so she brought up the hottest topic of that day, the day of worship. And so she says, you know, there's two places to worship. There's Mount Gerizim, or the mount that was in front of them where they were at, and Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus, where should I worship your God? Where should I go? Now, all rabbis, all Jewish rabbis, would have loved this question. Because they would have an answer for her. Well, of course, the place you worship God is in the temple. 
in Jerusalem. You have false worship. You're not worshiping in the right place. Jesus is such a radical teacher. You don't understand how radical this is until you understand how deeply embedded the thought of worshiping God in the temple was in the Jewish mind and in the rabbinical tradition. And so she was expecting to get into an argument with Christ. And Christ just blows her away. I mean, the answer is earth-shattering. Believe me, woman. He's saying, you know what I'm about to say? It's going to take a lot of faith. It's going to take a lot of faith on your part, too, to really comprehend what Jesus is about to say. Believe me, woman. You're going to have to have a lot of faith to hear this. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, saying you will not worship God on in the temple in Jerusalem. And it certainly is not going to be there. Wow. What is, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, there's going to come a day, and very shortly, and within a very short time, it was going to happen, when you can worship God anytime and any place. It won't matter if you're in the temple or Mount Gerizim, None of that will matter. And later on in this text, he says, God is spirit. God is spirit. And he's saying, I am going to open up a way through Christ, or through my shedding of my blood on the cross, where... What happened when Jesus died to the curtain? It was torn asunder. And that meant that we all have access to the worship of God now. And that we can worship God anywhere we want. See, God is spirit. That's his essential nature. He's not material. He's not confined to a place. He is everywhere at the same time. He fills the universe. He's infinite. He is present all the time in your life. You don't... Now, there's the corporate worship of the church. Absolutely. Paul talks about gathering together as a congregation, gathering together as a family of God, gathering together as the temple of God. When we gather together, something happens. Jesus is present wherever two or three are found, and and all of that. And so there is an aspect of corporate worship. But when you walk out of here, you know what? You can worship God this afternoon. You can worship God tonight. You can worship God at noon like we were able to do through this 21 uh, days of prayer. We worship God. I said, we're in a worship service. Isn't it great to worship God? Not on a Sunday morning, but, you know, on Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Thursday, Friday at noon. You can worship God any place, any time. And he wants your worship all the time. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. It's not going to be here. It's not going to be there. It's not in Mecca. It's not in the Gandhi River. It's not place. He's everywhere. And he's teaching a radical new way of worship. You don't have to go to the temple and do sacrifices anymore. I'm going to be that sacrifice. You can worship God anytime and any place. 
And when you get that concept, it will, it will turn your world upside down. God is spirit, which means he is 100% wherever you are. He is 100% there. He is present everywhere. Doesn't matter if you get stuck on Mars when there's a movie like that. And you don't know how to get off. Guess what? You should God is God is on Mars. All of God is there. What he wants from you and from me is a constant stream of worship to him. You don't have to wait till Sunday morning at 10 a.m. It's not, I'm glad you're here. But you don't have to wait. You can worship God wherever you are at. And that's what he is, Jesus is teaching here. Thirdly, worship is mediated by Jesus. Look what else Jesus says. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. There is wrong worship. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying to the Samaritans, you worship wrongly. It's unacceptable. Your worship is not correct. Your worship is not from the Jewish prophets promises about a Messiah, a Savior, who would come. It's, you know, there is wrong worship. It is just wrong. It's not correct. All the world religions is wrong worship. Sounds radical to say that today, doesn't it? It's incredible we live in that kind of age where all worship is equal. It's not Jesus is saying to the Samaritans, Samaritans, you don't have it right. Muslims don't have it right in worship. Buddhism does not have it right. It's not right. Samaritans didn't have it right. What is Right worship, it comes through the Savior that's going to come from the Jews. And Jesus identifying with the Jews says, I am a Jew. That's who I am. I believe, is what Jesus is saying, I believe that the prophets, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, the historical books, the poetry, all the Old Testament spoke of me. And he's going to say that later on. I am the Christ. That's what he said to her. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. I am the one who can open up the way. I am the one who will mediate your worship so that all people can worship God. Salvation is from the Jews. The promises, the prophecies, come from the Jews. We could get in some other things here, but I won't. I'm going to be good. But Jesus is a Jew. We need to respect that, too. And he's saying... Salvation, the covenants, the promises, the word, the oracles of God. I read in my devotions this morning from Romans, and, and Paul said the Jews have the very oracles, the very words of God are recorded, were given to them. But out of that was to come a Messiah. Out of that was to become a deliverer. Out of that was to become a Savior. And he's saying, I am that Savior. I mediate that. And through me, you can worship the Father. The whole Trinity is involved in worship. We worship Christ. We worship the Father through Christ by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Christ mediates it. I can worship the Father through the ministry of the Spirit of God in my life. 
God wants you to worship him. God wants you to really come before him and honor him as God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings, the creator of all the earth, creator of all the sea, creator of all the heavens and everything in them. He wants you to worship him because he has given you Christ. He's given you this Savior out of the Jewish people so that you could have a relationship with him. Worship is mediated by Jesus. And then, lastly, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. It says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. He's telling us about God. We don't know anything about God unless... Someone tells us Jesus was God in the flesh. And he's saying, God is spirit. I know who God is because I'm God. And I know God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We have to worship God in spirit and truth. Let's take truth. What's it mean to worship God in truth? John 17, 17, what's it say? Your word is what? Truth. Pilate said, what is truth? We're all looking for truth. Jesus says, I am truth. Word is truth. And so our worship has to be guided by this book. This book has to enlighten our minds so we know who we are worshiping. Because if we don't know who we are worshiping, we're worshiping a God of our imagination. And that's what all this world religion is about. It's all about man's imaginations. But this book is truth. And so as we meditate this, engage our minds, you know, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, body, and soul, or strength and soul, and and so our minds have to be engaged with truth. And as truth takes us to God, and we have an understanding of God, now we're getting ready to worship him in spirit. Worship is simply a response to the truth. You must never try to worship God without truth. You must never, uh, you know, some people, you know, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, never stopped me before, I guess, but. <laughs> I love music, but listen. This has to be the ground. What leads us is the scriptures. And to have concerts and all that without this is a problem. You have to have this. You have to have the truth, the speaking of the truth. You must always have truth. You know, when we did this 21 days of prayer, I had a great time. And I had these different people who spoke for 15, 20 minutes. Because, why did I do that? Because our prayers, even our prayers, have to be led by the truth. If we're not grounded to the truth of who God is, what the gospel is, you're going to be everywhere. You don't know who you're praying to. Every time you pray, you really have to be reminded who you're praying to. Someone did a deal on the names of God. That was awesome. Why? Why do we need the names of God before we pray? It's because we need to know who we're praying to. If you don't know who you're praying to... You're not praying and you're not worshiping. It's unacceptable to God. The truth of the gospel. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I need to be filled with the Spirit of God. I need to read his book. I need to be understanding who he is. Those truths must guide our worship. 
And so that's sort of the Jerusalem side, if you want to look at it this way. That's, that's what the Pharisees were into. They had the word. They had the prophecies. But their hearts were far away from God. You speak truth to me, but your hearts are far away, and it's unacceptable to me to have a cold heart. This is what God says when it comes to worship. He says you must worship God in spirit and truth. Spirit simply is your heart. Spirit's your inner person. Spirit is what you can't see. And so our spirits must be enlivened. Our feelings, our experience, our affections is the old word. Has to be engaged too, according to Christ. Because if you're not engaging the heart, you have dead orthodoxy. You have ritual. You have liturgy that's dead. And has no meaning to you. You got the truth, but your heart's not engaged. You got a problem. Now, if your heart's engaged by the truth, now we got the balance. But if you have all emotion over here, all experience and no truth, you got a problem too. And so you have to have this balance. Truth flies, I can remember my father saying this, truth flies on two wings, always. There's always a balance. One wing is truth, one wing is spirit. If you want to take off in your worship, you need both. If your heart is cold toward God and you've never felt anything in the worship of God, you've never had shed one tear, you've never had any kind of emotional connection with God, you have a problem with Jesus. Because it's not me saying this, Jesus saying, you must worship me in spirit and in truth. There must be the engagement of your heart in God. Or it's dead. See, the Jews, see, Samaria, let's, see, let's, let's let the Samaritan and Samaria do represent that as the feeling, the emotional side of worship. Of, and then over here you've got Jerusalem, the dead orthodoxy, which Jesus hated. He just hated that. He just, he would get so upset at the Pharisees because their heart was so far away from God. But he also is not approving of pure emotion with no truth. And you have to have both. Where are you at in that spectrum? We get out of balance. My guess for us folk here today is the heart. That's the problem. <laughs> we got truth. We got truth everywhere. We got teaching, preaching, radio. But does it mean anything to us? Are we moved deeply? Deeply? Is there anything of depth that God's touching? We have to have the Spirit involved, our spirits, our Hearts, our souls, engaged. It has to reach us. If we're going to reach up to God in worship, we must reach up to God in truth and with our hearts together. If you have one without the other, you do not have Jesus kind of worship. You don't have it. You're not worshiping how Jesus wants you to worship. How do we do this? How does this work? I believe the key to worship is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God will illuminate your mind so you can understand the truth it will also, he will also set your fire, set your heart on fire with love for him. 
And I think there's a great need today to experience worship. Just not here, but everywhere. I want you to think of this. I want to go back to this concept, God is spirit. I've been meditating on that all week long. And it's revolutionizing my life as I think about that. God is spirit. He is spirit. He's not contained in a building. He's not contained in an idol. And this is why I was so against idolatry. Because it made God material. God is not material. God's immaterial. His spirit goes on for all eternity. Into infinity. Can you think of infinity? Just close your eyes. If you want to close your eyes. Just think of this. What's beyond the universe? The spirit of God. God is spirit. He fills it all. Wherever you are at, God is there. A hundred percent, completely there. You can worship God any moment you want to. You can worship God at work. See, what Jesus is doing here, he is this distinction between the secular and the sacred is going out the window here, folks. In other words, I go to the temple, I'm sacred. This is where God is. I'm leaving the temple, this is secular. I can do whatever I want. I go to church on Sunday, that's sacred. Monday I go to work, that's secular. God's left here in this building. That's how some of you think. God is here in this building. When I walk in here, I'm walking in the God. Let me tell you, God is not only here, he's with you at home. He's with you in the car. He's with you at work. He's with you all the time because he is spirit. He's not contained by any building. Let God out. Worship him. He's with you all the time. And he's waiting for you to honor him. Everywhere. Every place. All the time. We have an awesome God. And he deserves our worship. Let me say this few more things here. See, I got time. I, got, I can actually see the clock, so we're in good shape. <laughs> worship is about giving, not getting. Many of you will say, some of you. All right, very few of you because you're such awesome people. We'll say, I didn't get anything out of the worship service. I didn't get anything out of the sermon. I didn't get anything out of my class. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. I didn't get this. This is not this. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. What do you think worship is? It's giving. It's giving of our time, of our voice, of our energy of our focus, of our minds and hearts. It's giving of our money. It's giving of our voices to God. It's all about giving of ourselves completely over to our great God. It has nothing to do with what you are getting. God deserves our very best to give to him. Give to him. Serve God with your very best. Love God. Worship God. Honor him. Giving 
your heart, giving your soul, giving your money, giving your possessions. Give everything to God because he is worthy. And not here, just here. But I'm talking about every day. Every day. Wrestle with God. Wrestle with him. I was reading about Jacob this morning. Wrestle with God about who he is and what he wants in your life and purpose and and worship. and, And just wrestle through that. Till finally you can see the glory of God. Honor God. Love him. We will worship God. We will reach up to God. This will happen in this congregation because it's right. It's true. And it needs to happen. God is all in all. He is the blessed one. He's the eternal one, the all-wise one. He's righteous. He's merciful. He's graceful. He provides all that we have. He's the creator of everything we see. We need to worship him. Don't mess with God. (laughs) Don't mess with him. Some of you are just messing around, really. You have not a clue what this is about. You don't know. You don't understand. God wants us to worship him. And he wants this community to be full of worshipers. Your neighbor, your friends, your family. To worship God. Let's pray. Lord, We want to be worshipers that you seek. We want to worship in spirit and truth. We want to move beyond just worshiping on Sunday morning. We want to worship you all the time. We want to be so caught up in your presence. We want your truth to change our hearts, to to move our minds, and, and then we want to engage our, 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 our hearts with the truth. We don't want duty. We don't want obligation. We don't want ritualism. We want your presence. We want your joy. Thank you for this time together. And Lord, we need the filling of your spirit. I pray that that would happen. In Christ's name, amen. Stand together. If you have a need that you'd like to pray about, we have those who would love to pray with you. If you just want to come and worship God before you leave, that would be awesome too. Feel free to do that. Greet one another once I'm done praying here. And, and uh, let's go knowing that God has